so, yeah, Sclerotics uh, isn't well known um, here. We have uh, focused very much on what we're doing uh, in the overseas market um, and how we can grow uh, out there. It was established, uh, or a parent company was established in 1998. We were building custom uh, training solutions for corporate. We found ourselves in a situation where we were always uh, exceeding the expectations, uh, but kept hitting the same barriers and problems uh, all the way along. Uh, and it all came back to one key issue, which was that you can't uh, measure the return on investment from training. Uh, so we started to focus in on that, and then we formed uh, Scalytics uh, later on. Um, our mission uh, was pretty bold, basically uh, to recognise uh, and enable human potential through data-driven API, uh, data-driven AIs. So thinking about uh, both the human resources space and the training space, and actually thinking about where that needs to be in the future. And we don't believe it looks much like uh, what we see in, in uh, training departments and HR departments currently. Um, we, uh, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the sort of things that we do. I was asked more to focus on some of our uh, learnings through failure, um, which I don't mind uh, talking about. Um, it's slightly disconcerting to see so many people turning up to hear about failure. Uh, so uh, if that's not what you are here for, then you've just failed, uh, and maybe you uh, look somewhere else. But um, we have uh, development tools for building personalised learning solutions. Uh, so it's really about thinking about the individual and what it is that they need. Uh, the solutions that we create uh, can be tuned out for uh, tablets, all sorts of different devices, mobile devices, uh, etc. Uh, and we also work uh, with regards to the VR and AR space, thinking about how we make those technologies work. Um, and as Helen was just saying, we've uh, lately had some really great success by collaborating. Uh, and this was a VR environment that was put together by Cerebral Fix, um, fantastic company, also based at uh, Epic. So if anyone from Cerebral's here. Um, and you know, the reality is by collaborating together, we're able to uh, look at uh, what an end-to-end -end solution in uh, VR is. If you're trying to train 25,000 people, what does that actually look like? Because it's not just about that VR piece. Um, analytics is a huge part uh, of what we're doing. If you're going to drive this, uh, you know, create a, a human enablement through data-driven um, AI, you really need to understand exactly what someone is learning. Uh, and for us, this has been the, the major innovation or the, the thing that we're trying to achieve. Uh, if you can create content that drives the data to tell uh, business leaders exactly what it is uh, that you're doing uh, and what learners are doing, uh, then you're able to uh, you know, make some big impact. Um, another aspect to that is looking at data and saying, what if it's not about analyzing uh, data through Tableau or Power BI or something like that? Is there other ways that we might want to access that data and what does that look like? Um, so we'll see uh, if our internet connection uh, is going here, but I'll just give you a quick demonstration of that with regard to this. So we've got a, a standard Alexa, uh, Alexa device here. Alexa, launch control center. Welcome. How can I help? Select group number 3247. Going to ab initio group number 3247. What's the average knowledge transfer? For which topic or module? Galley security procedures. 83% of learners exhibited strong theoretical knowledge when attempting virtual exercises, while 91% of learners exhibited accurate knowledge of processes when conducting physical assessments. What training has been automatically deployed? 4% of existing CAD and crew have been targeted with corrective materials in the last four weeks. 13% of CAD and crew have requested resources to fill self-assessed knowledge gaps. 22% of CAD and crew have requested automated knowledge assessments relating to recurrent practicals. Stop. Thanks for using Control Center. See you. So part of that is, is really just thinking about how is it we want to interact with data and understand uh, exactly what's going on. And dashboards are great, uh, but looking at other ways to achieve that uh, once you've got the data source there. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about our learnings through failure. Um, we've had lots uh, of learnings and failures. failures. Um, it is really more about uh, multiple failures. Um, and that was one right there. Uh, business growth requires new premises. Um, so this was uh, one of our early issues uh, when we first formed Scalytics. We knew that we needed new premises. 
Uh, and I'm going to jump to a tangent story, which I'll link back to. Um, like most uh, sports-loving guys, uh, I had been campaigning my wife for a big TV for about two years. Uh, and finally, uh, come uh, Christmas time, I managed to, uh, to convince her, got one, uh, and it was pride of place on the wall. We'll come back to that point. We, uh, we had to make a move. We were moving from just behind the CTV uh, building, where that was, uh, and we were moving over to this location, uh, redecked the entire floor of the CDC, uh, Union House, or, or CDC on the bottom, so basically taking over the top floor, uh, and had it all set up for our needs. Uh, and we were going to move over five days, so starting Friday, uh, and then we had the Monday, Tuesday. Um, we took what we believed were all of the key precautions, um, planned it out, we had increased our insurance uh, to make sure if someone dropped a server or something like that, uh, and we had three lots of backups. We had our server, uh, or servers, we had uh, the code that was on each individual's machine, uh, and then added to that we had off-site hard drives which were on a rotation uh, between two different people, uh, and they would rotate. I went away for that weekend, something that we couldn't avoid, a uh, long weekend away to brother-in-law's wedding uh, in Kaiteri Teri, uh, and came back on the Monday night uh, to find that our house had been burgled, and you guessed it, they took the six-week-old big TV, uh, and so uh, at that point in time, I'd have to say, I saw that that was the biggest issue around. I, I, it, was, it dominated my thinking. Um, losing this big TV. And I went into work the next day on the Tuesday morning uh, thinking, right, we've, uh, we've managed, the, the team has managed to move most of the hardware and things across the new office. Now it's about setting up the network, getting things sorted. Um, and of course, these were our moving days. So what happened was because we had uh, arrived back to a burglary the night before, my wife, who was 20 weeks pregnant, uh, and we also had a seven-month-old had taken one extra day off, so she decided to go and sort the insurance uh, in Latimer Square, uh, and we thought we'd meet for lunch at, um, uh, at Joe's Garage on the corner. So she rang me and said, hey, I'm just walking in there now. We were only about 100 metres away. Uh, and I came down, ran in the door, sat down. She was sitting in a booth seat feeding our seven-month-old when the earthquake hit. Um, quite quickly, everyone that was in that building ran, got out, we found we were pretty much the only ones left with the exception of th uh, three people that, that were still in the kitchen. Uh, I grabbed the buggy, uh, which our seven month old was still in, ran to that door uh, and was about to go out the door and I realised that my wife wasn't behind me. Uh, she was still stuck in the booth seat. Uh, but the three people from the kitchen were running out. Uh, so I pulled away from the door uh, to let them go through. I wasn't about to walk out without my wife. So uh, unfortunately the building uh, collapsed on top of those three people. Um, the end result for us was that we were then stuck inside. So we managed to break out the side door. If anyone remembered a security camera footage about six weeks after with some people coming out with a buggy, that was us. <laughs> um, we were amazed to see ourselves on that, uh, to see a different perspective on what happened. But the reality was uh, we then started to think once we went back, checked that the staff were all okay. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until about a week later where we'd sort of calmed down and we suddenly realised, right, where is our stuff? Now, we thought we had pretty good planning in place, taken all the precautions. But what had happened was that the person who uh, alternated the uh, off-site backups um, had taken my backups for the weekend because I was away on the Friday, and he had both sets of hard drives uh, at his location. Knowing I was coming back and I was going to be in there on the Tuesday morning, he bought both sets back in to hand one back to me and then update, update his set. We couldn't get back in the offices, which meant we had both sets of our backups in there as well as our server and all of our machines. Um, the reality of that was that that uh, one incident, thinking that we had solved everything and we took the precautions, uh, could have sunk us right near the start of the process. Um, the lessons learned from that one uh, is basically just to pretend your offices burned down regularly. And I mean that. It's not about having the, the process or the theory. It's about actually thinking, uh, stop your staff from going into work, take them off site and go, the building's just burnt down. What have we just lost? 
Uh, and we were quite um, lucky at that time to really think through some of that. We worked with a guy named Ben Reed, uh, who started to think about those processes and what we needed to put in place uh, and to ensure that basically if that happened again, uh, we could walk out just by machines and off we went. Um, we also uh, learned to stay focused on what really counts. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, while it seemed like the worst thing, um, prior to that, the worst thing was me losing my TV. Uh, I hope it landed on the guy. Um, but uh, you know, the reality is um, you had to stay focused. Our next uh, interesting um, learning came from our US expansion. Uh, we signed our first uh, Fortune 500 company. And basically, we were accepted into the Kiwi landing pad, uh, San Francisco based. And uh, we thought everything was set. Good time zone crossover, Kiwi landing pad, a bunch of other Kiwi companies. Um, and I happened to be talking to um, uh, a guy over a coffee, uh, Sean Ryan from SLI, mount, uh, wealth of, of wisdom, uh, who just asked me one simple question. Uh, I was talking to him because he had a San Jose office and asking about that, and he just said to me, Glenn, um, aren't you focused on the Fortune 500 market? I said, yeah. He said, I wonder where they're all based. Uh, and I sort of looked at it and thought, well, I don't know, they're probably spread all over the States. Uh, of course, I went back straight after that coffee, started doing some research, and I found that about 360 of them were based on the east coast of the Fortune 500. So while it uh, made sense um, to focus uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, in actual fact, uh, we ended up shifting to New York. So we caught that one uh, right before we were about to make a big mistake. Otherwise, it was going to be doing some pretty serious miles. Um, the other issue I had, of course, was now I had to convince my better half that we were going to move literally around the other side of the world to New York, time zone was going to be difficult, etc. Uh, and added to that, I'd only driven in the States uh, once before, uh, and so we were taking uh, my wife, uh, two kids, two-year-old and, and uh, three-year-old over at the time. Uh, we arrived late one night into Newark uh, Liberty Airport. Um, this is what it looks, down, uh, looks like from a topographical view. Picked up our uh, rental car uh, and Basically, I got in the car, um, second time driving in the US, and I have to say, uh, there was a lot of very terrified looking people on that interchange. Most were in my car, uh, but the reality is uh, the TomTom -tom didn't actually help a lot. In fact, I think the woman on that needed some counseling uh, soon after. Uh, so that was some entry into the US for us. Lessons learned, um, don't pick your landing pad based on what seems like an easy entry, which is exactly what we were about to do. Um, growth readiness, next issue that we had once we were in the States uh, is um, I'd been networking uh, and landed some fantastic meetings, one with Walmart uh, and largest company in the world, thought great, success is easy, didn't take too long, only a couple of failures, uh, but the reality is we got way way down the track, fourth meeting, conversations and they said hey we want to go ahead, uh, let's see how we can roll this out. Um, and at that point, uh, started to ask a few other questions about what they were planning to use it for, how we would you know, uh, roll it out, what the time frame was, uh, and basically realised the scale of that company and that we weren't ready for it. Um, I'd have to say it was probably my most sleepless night, uh, trying to run every strategy through my head as to how to make this thing happen, uh, but the scale and what they were trying to achieve uh, was enormous. The learning from that uh, was that we came back and uh, we re-architected our entire uh, big data platform. We changed a number of different things uh, and are now ready to take on 100 Walmarts consecutively if we wanted to. So um, that was a key uh, lesson in that process. Um, another one for us was market readiness. Um, part of the idea of going to the US was to understand the market, uh, understand and figure out our strategy. We weren't actually trying to go over there to sell. Uh, that would have been a bonus if we did, but it was really understand what our strategy had to look like. Um, but one of the issues that we had uh, was that we were effectively disrupting not only the thinking, um, we had something that to us was absolutely inevitable. But what we hadn't taken into account was uh, we were in an industry that was extremely uninnovative. Um, and the problem with that was uh, we were looking at it and saying, why would you invest in building training if you cannot determine whether it's working or not? This makes no sense. No one runs a business and makes decisions if you can't actually see what the, uh, the ROI is going to be. Why should it be any different for training? Um, 
so it made a lot of sense. Uh, I was talking in conferences in the, in the States uh, about these topics, and it suddenly occurred to us that we were the only ones talking about these two topics. Uh, adaptive and personalized learning uh, built on tools that are designed to drive data so that we can measure and understand exactly what's going on. Uh, but the problem um, was that the mindset just wasn't there. Um, we were talking to people who uh, had been doing things the traditional way. Uh, the market simply was not ready for what we were talking about at that time. Uh, and so what we then had to do was figure out how we were going to fix that situation. Uh, and for us, the key one was uh, we need to start focusing on those early adopters. The companies who are already at that stage in thinking, uh, and they are looking for those solutions. Um, but I'd have to say it, it was a bit of a, um, a, an issue for us in those early stages, uh, suddenly realizing, gosh, are we going to have to educate this market? Uh, you know, that's not a pretty uh, position to be in. Um, so being first to market isn't always best, uh, especially if you have to educate that market. Um, uh, and for us, uh, you know, yeah, that was a big one. In some ways, I, I suppose in the background, we were hoping that another player would have come in and uh, educated the market for us, and we would have simply come through on their coattails with a better, better product and better solution. But uh, it didn't happen when we rolled out our big data system. In Atlanta last year, it was the first uh, uh, big data system specifically designed for corporate learning, um, and still is uh, at this point. Um, so the last thing uh, for us, as far as learning, is we've always had extremely strong ambition and a vision of how things should be. Um, so it's a case for us of, of always trying to look at um, you know, what, it is it, uh, what is it that we're trying to do, how is it that we want to see our industry be uh, in 10 or 15 years' time, uh, not next year. We're not trying to build tools for today, we're trying to build tools for next week. Um, so for us, uh, as I said at the start, we were sort of looking at it and saying, well, training, uh, L&D, human resources, we believe that those two departments and companies will end up uh, disappearing and they'll be replaced with something that we term as human enablement, uh, which is just how do we enable our people to do things better, give them what they need. The software industry has already demonstrated uh, clearly uh, that it can uh, get by without much influence from human resources and training. Uh, we're very self-sufficient, uh, we move very quickly, uh, and so that for us was one of those keys. So we had this uh, big picture vision. And the reality for our industry is it's broken into four sectors. Um, so another aspect in our vision is, well, we didn't believe that a lot of these sectors made any sense. Uh, and we certainly couldn't see how they would make sense uh, if everything was to change. Infrastructure providers uh, were the ones slowing innovation down. Um, shelf product or turnkey solutions, content uh, tool vendors, et cetera. And really, uh, really, the one at the end there, the people who are actually building the learning uh, content are the ones that are doing the, the real work of what's happening in the training industry. Uh, so our ambition um, goes even further. So talk about trying to, to get as big as you can. Uh, be the Uber and the AWS for the uh, training and HR industry. If we slap Facebook and Google and Space Force on there as well, uh, maybe we could get slightly bigger in our ambition, but um, it's not quite as, as it seems. We're not trying to build out Amazon's infrastructure. Uh, we're effectively building on top of Amazon, but we're building out services specialized to a niche, platforms uh, or pass and SaaS uh, in that area. And from an Uber perspective, we're wanting to democratize this industry. Uh, so it's about putting the, the tools in the hands of people to be able to create uh, amazingly sophisticated training quickly and easily on their terms uh, and get it out to as many people as fast as we can. Um, so we started our process uh, very much around these areas. Uh, our thinking was we needed uh, to drive the data, we needed to build tools that would enable the data to be driven, uh, and we wanted to be able to uh, host and monetize those. Uh, and the reality is that uh, strategy has grown um, to uh, a number of different areas and we've continued to build out uh, things all over the place. But the reality is that along the way, uh, as we've gone through this, as we talk about our ambition and our vision, um, as a small company, you know, you're often bringing in different advisors along the way, different people uh, have different opinions. And one of the things for us that we sort of see as a failure is not realizing that we needed to stick with our gut 
uh, on some areas when it came to what we understood about our industry. Um, so our vision for some people was potentially too ambitious, uh, and some advisors, as you're growing through that journey uh, as a company, uh, you know, the reality is that for some advisors, it's simply out of their comfort zone. Um, and you know, they want to put things into a model, into business models they know, what they have experience with, et cetera. Uh, so from that, um, you know, the reality is now uh, we stuck with that ambition and we're working with three of the world's largest companies in our key verticals. Um, we uh, just did a proje project again with uh, Cerebral Fix um, last year in Dubai. Uh, we worked with Emirates redesigning uh, or designing the future of what training in the aviation industry looked like. Uh, we covered everything from IoT, big data, uh, VR, all sorts of different areas, uh, AI machine learning, just to, to sort of cover the bases as wide as we could. Um, and now we're continuing to, uh, to work with them. The reality is uh, the lesson that we learned was to always listen to your advisors. Uh, absolutely, you need that sounding board, but to make sure you understand their limits. Um, uh, we found with certain companies, some of those uh, large companies that we're dealing with now, that are the dominant companies in those verticals, uh, that they were looking for the company that was thinking about the vision of 10 to 15 years ahead, not the ones that were looking for two to three years ahead. Uh, so when we happened to find those companies, uh, we realised that actually we were right, uh, and they had been looking for us as well. So it was just trying to, to figure that out, uh, and now work with them to be able to build uh, and the last thought, uh, I suppose, for us on this is, um, you know, a number of people uh, said to us along the way that, you know, I think this is impossible, you were thinking too big, narrow your focus, come down to this, etc. Uh, and the reality is, you know, they're right with regards to, you know, this is impossible. Um, for them it is. Thank you. And it's, um, it's actually really inspiring to hear people talking about some of their failures, and I know that's something that we quite often talk about that we need to do a bit more of. So there's actually a couple of questions about that. Um, and just to remind you, um, Slido's where all the questions are coming through, and um, you should be able to get access to that through um, either directly through Slido or through Attendify. The apps um, should have been sent the details of how to do that. Uh, it makes sense to share ideas of failure, but is there a way to share failure experiences if success is not ensured? How do you train people to share failures? So I think the nub of that question is how do you kind of get people more open about sharing stuff ups when actually there's a vulnerability about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, it, it's creating the right culture for it, uh, and that's a hard thing. It's, it's one of the things that, that we're doing with companies where it's the training culture. Uh, is, is based on failure. I mean, in a, in a training context, you learn the most through consequence, uh, good or bad. Uh, so in actual fact, if you can generate that culture that it's not about uh, blame, uh, and for us, we have to be really careful with this because we're in the data area. The, the worst nightmare for us is the idea that training data that is starting to detail behaviours and, and, and skills and competencies could be used against employees. For us, that is the worst. Uh, and so, you know, as one of the first companies in that space, you know, we're trying to figure out what are the standards and how do we, uh, how do, we do this. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next question, how are you solving the issue around educating your market? Yeah, I, um, good question. Um, the key thing, I suppose, that we've, uh, we've realised is it's about uh, just showing them. Uh, the end solution, so uh, not thinking that they are going to put, put all the pieces together and figure it out themselves uh, and remove all barriers to entry. So uh, often you know, the reason they will they'll look at some new innovations and new tech and say, gosh, this is amazing, uh, we, that's absolutely where we want to be in five years. And you go, well, actually, you could be there like really quickly. Uh, so you know, when you start understanding why, what are all of those different reasons that they're thinking five years ahead, uh, you realise that this is, in their mind there's a whole pile of barriers. Um, the existing infrastructure they're using, how is it going to work with that, integrations, all sorts of other things. So if you can remove all those barriers and make it dead easy for them to get involved, um, yeah, that's a, a faster way to get them to get in it and, and, and use it. Yep. Uh, somebody's asked, uh, how did you, what advice did you get or how did you go about setting up a US base? What advice did you get? Oh, well, we were lucky. We didn't fail on that one. But we, um, we effectively set up a Delaware-based company. 
Uh, and um, we happened through some networking um, to find a fantastic accounting company called HBC, uh, Atlanta-based. They are a zero premium partner uh, who have Kiwis working for them, Aussies working for them. They understand all of the, the issues. They understand all the tax laws, the company setups, etc. So we landed on our feet with that one. HBC, anyone looking at the US market? Good accounting firm. Yep. Based in the US? Or? Uh, based in Atlanta. Um, so you've talked quite a lot about innovating across your technology. Are you innovating in other parts of your business? Yeah, um, we, we uh, are certainly trying to. Um, one of the areas for us is that we've got a whole pile of different things and there's different uh, pricing models and things based around that. Uh, and we are looking at the idea of a model that is actually based on learning impact. Uh, we utilise a number of different technologies and because we're tracking the data in such detail, uh, that's always been our focus, can we then uh, have a pricing model that's based on did this person actually learn uh, and, and understanding that. So that's certainly an area that's going to be um, interesting. It, it, it's not a given yet, but that's what we're thinking of trying to achieve. Cool. And the last question. Um, how do you manage your stress as a CEO? I mean, you talked about a really stressful time in February, but generally speaking? Yeah, I, th I think this is a good one. Um, I went to Southern SAS uh, the other week, I'm not sure if anyone uh, else was there, um, and this is a topic that came up a lot. I, I think, um, I, I do think that, especially as CEOs and founders of startups, we need to, uh, to be a lot more open about our failures and see them uh, for exactly that. It's, it's just a way to, um, you know, to, to uh, overcome problems and, and things as you go, it's, it's not a, a reflection of you, uh, even though some of the things you look back and think, well, it was a bit stupid, uh, why didn't we think through that? Uh, but yeah, I mean, my view is um, there's, there's different ways to manage that stress. For me, um, sometimes you find as a CEO uh, or a startup that you can't talk to your employees about certain things just because it doesn't make sense. Uh, they don't understand all of the things that are, that are going on. You don't want to burden them with, with worries. Uh, you can't talk sometimes to your investors because they only want to hear the optimistic, the, you know, the positive stuff. Um, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where the board is not actually uh, the, the right skill sets or experience to be able to support you properly. Uh, and so at that point it can feel quite lonely when, when things are going down. Um, for me, one of my solutions uh, to it was to um, bring my wife into the company. Um, so then I had someone else that could actually understand uh, to bounce things off. So in the early days I had a business partner uh, when we formed in 1998 um, and that worked quite well as a sounding board. Uh, but just finding that one person that you can share every detail with uh, doesn't mean that they're solving the problem. Just to be able to share it uh, certainly helps. But I think, yeah, again, if we can grow that community uh, more it would be great.